The final speaker for this session is Ian Anderson, who is the lead for innovation and data at Oz Minerals. He's been part of the company's exploration team for nearly 13 years and has planned, drilled and logged uh, a hell of a lot of core, let's just say, um, of regional exploration, exploration diamond drilling around the Golacradon and has been involved in resource definition and extension work um, in many of our really large deposits, including Carapatina, Camsen and Fremantle Doctor. Uh, I think what we really need to focus on here today is that Ian is going to be talking about how Oz Minerals is using pre-competitive data and applying the team's in-house toolkit to gain an advantage in South Australian base metal exploration. It should be a really great talk. Please join me in welcoming Ian. Thanks, Anna. So my name is Ian Anderson. We've got a lot to get through today. Uh, let's just jump right in. I'm, I'm going to be talking about gaining a pre-competitive advantage in South Australia. Uh, I don't think I'm going to make any forward-looking statements, other than you can probably find me in the pub later. But if I do, uh, disregard them. So uh, just a little bit about my team at Oz Minerals. We're the innovation and data team. We were formed in 2020 on the back of the Explorer, the Explorer Challenge. Uh, that was a big crowd challenge that we ran in 2019. And what came from that is maybe cultural change in the department, and we started thinking, you know, maybe there is something to data-driven methodologies that can give some new geologic insights or take us to a new discovery. So our team's responsible for conceptualizing, creating, and applying new additions to the exploration toolkit. Uh, and one of our goals is to try and bring along as minimal preconceived geologic bias as possible, at least at the beginning. We can put it on at the end. Uh, we're also responsible for geoscientific and spatial data management, for visioning, that sort of thing. And in 2022, we started working on uh, sustainability function work and exploration comms. So our team is about 10 people at the moment, some, some with us for a short time, some for a long time. If you see any of these people in the crowd today, go say hi, they're wonderful people. Uh, so what do I mean when I'm talking about a, a pre-competitive advantage? This is a portmanteau of the, the finest caliber. So what I'm saying is everyone in the state has access to this wonderful pre-competitive data, and we're seeing a lot of really interesting things today that really back that statement up. Uh, so where do you get your competitive advantage from? That, that comes from uh, things like access to maybe private data, or that comes from having the resources to attract and retain the best talent, or peg ground or test targets. So what, what is a pre-competitive advantage? A pre-competitive advantage is the philosophy of edging out a competitive advantage using only this pre-competitive data. And I'm going to show you some examples of what can be done using only public data to compete more efficiently against your peers. So let's start. Maybe your board says, hey, we're really interested in a new project in South Australia. Uh, we want it to be demonstrated to have elevated potential for IOCGs. This is a fairly simple blanket statement. You probably run into this often enough. So your goal is going to be, in, in the paradigm of the data innovation team, we're looking for a data-driven method to rapidly search for uh, a near miss in historic work, and we want to characterize it. We also want to try and make some intelligent decisions in places where we're missing information. Uh, so maybe we're missing some elemental values or, or something like that. <clears throat> so we just we call these the near miss models, and this is probably the most tame of our branding in the team, as you'll see. So an example of a good place to start here, I've seen Adrian in the crowd today. He's done a lot of good work in describing the geochemical characteristics of IOCG systems in the state. And if you're an academic, you can go and find his work on ResearchGate. You can go and see him in the crowd today. If you're lazy like me, just go on YouTube. You can watch plenty of videos where he describes this sort of thing. Uh, and look, similar fingerprinting work has been done in, in geochemical domain across loads of other deposit styles and alteration characteristics. So research what you're after and develop a fingerprinting criteria. As a data-rich example, in Oz Minerals, we have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of samples drilled both within and around the deposits that we work on. So in our case, we, we build these up using a combination of geologic insight and machine learning to build a really robust multi-element fingerprint. And we use these to answer questions like, in that exploration drill hole, if there was a carapatina hiding nearby and we missed it, how far away did we miss by? Are we closer or not? So really similar to Adrian's work, we're just developing a geochemical fingerprint and we're applying that to exploration, exploration drill results. Let's say you're missing data, and, and Holly, you're working really hard on this, and thank you very much. I see you and your work is valuable. But if you're missing data, you have to make some decisions about what you're going to do. So right now, SARIG has about 2.3 million public geochemical uh, uh, say results that you can download and, and work with. And we want to be able to flag those for historic near misses. 
Those definitely exist. There were two drill programs that missed Prominent Hill by less than 100 meters, first in 1990 and then another one in 1993. And Prominent Hill took another uh, 12 years after the first one. So these probably also exist elsewhere in the state. The trouble here is that there's many generations of data. You have detection limit differences, different labs, et cetera. But for the time being, let's just pretend something is better than nothing. The other problem you'll find is that not every sample has been assayed for all elements. Lab work used to be much more expensive than it is today, and if an explorer is only interested in a small base metal suite, that might be all that you get. So what we do there is uh, we've run a crowd competition earlier this year called Where in the World Did the Value for Zinc Go, which might be a Carmen San Diego branding mishap. But uh, the training data for this competition was four and a half million public assay data samples from both Western Australia and SA. We used those four and a half million and the power of uh, the crowd, basically, to develop data science driven models where we can impute missing assay values into an assay that doesn't have a value for, in this case, zinc. So if you have your fingerprinting criteria and an imputation model, you can go about imputing anything that's missing and you can run 2.3 million samples through your fingerprinting criteria. So this is what SA looks like. Every one of those dots is a geochem sample. Uh, there's more because that they drill downwards, so some of them are hidden behind other dots. But that's what the map looks like. And if we were to filter out maybe the top 2% of a maybe a Carapatina model score, we see there's a really nice bright corridor that comes up here through the known deposit belt. We get nice tight clusters around deposits in the public data, so it validates what we're doing here is accurate and, and real. But we also start to light up some interesting things out here in the Olary, uh, sort of the northern Fowler and Christie. We see interesting clusters of anomalous IOCG model results up in, even in the Musgrave. So that's rather interesting. And we're, we're turning up nice tight clusters in these places. We've got a nice band that comes up here from Hillside all the way up to Spencer and then along the eastern side of the, the Gola Ranges National Park as well, which is probably a little bit underexplored. So look, just from pre-competitive data here, we've developed a multi-element imputation model. We've also developed a multi-element geochemical model and we're finding fingerprints in spots where there's a strong match for known mineralization in unique places in the state. So we can now go out and focus our activity on these high potential locations and I think that is an example of a pre-competitive advantage. So you go back to your board and they say, well, that's wonderful, but we're also interested in IOCG targets that are demonstrated to have favorable economics. And uh, well, look, we need to have clear hurdles before we go about processing, and, or sorry, progressing these targets. So it gets a little bit more difficult here. You, you still need a data-driven method to generate targets and evaluate them, but now you have to return a theoretical investment, uh, return a theoretical return on investment. So we want to locate every single IOCG lookalike and then put some sort of financial criteria over the top and prioritize our activity that way. So we do this in-house, we call this the block golem. Where are you gonna start? Well, here's our fingerprinting work that we've done over top of CAMSIN in resistivity, time domain EM, chargeability MT. Not very compelling, that's the, the outline of the ore body right there. And here's the same sort of thing, there's Carapatina and there's Fremantle Doctor in resistivity, chargeability MT, EM. Uh, not, not very compelling. This is CAMSIN and gravity and mag. Constrained, looks really good. And same, this is constrained, Fremantle and Carapatina and gravity and mag. So I'm gonna make the argument here that gravity is the best tool for exploring prior CGs undercover. Why would I say that? Well, that's physical fundamental principles. If you go down to it, a significant accumulation of iron oxide plus some copper and gold, they're probably gonna be more dense than the surrounding rock. And so it makes sense that we're gonna chase gravity anomalies. Sandra Bullock here agrees. <laughs> Your financial limitations apply. There's more than a million such anomalies in South Australia, and if you want to test every single one of those to 600 meters, it's going to cost you about $200 billion. Not many people have that kind of cash. So you need a way to prioritize where you're going to focus your effort. And what we're going to do here is we're going to use Monash University's Blue Cap Financial Model that they released in June of 2020, and we'll apply an economic assessment to every single one of those anomalies. So what does Blue Cap need to run? We need to know the footprint of the, the, the conceptual deposit. We need to know the geometry and the depth extent to mineralization. We need an idea of the grade. We need to know the depth to mineralization. We need to know what infrastructure exists around the hypothetical discovery, including rail and power and that sort of thing. And we also need to have a reasonable guess as to what the capex would be of building a mine if we made a discovery there. So 
what we really want to do is for any given location on our map, we want to go ahead and query directly what is the latitude, the longitude, the depth of a potential ore body, what's the geometry, is it tabular or spherical or cylindrical, uh, how big is it, what's the grade, how many tons are going to be there, and is there any infrastructure nearby. If we can manage to query all of that stuff out, we pump that into BlueCap, and BlueCap will come back and it'll give us an NPV. Is it the actual NPV? Probably not, but it's a level playing field this way, and so we can at least rank things against one another. What do we need to do that? This is where it gets interesting. If you want to go through and invert all of the anomalies in SA in order to get size and geometry and that sort of thing, you're going to need a state scale gravity survey. Luckily for us, that became available in 2019 with the GSA gravity grid. This actually covers all of Australia. You need gravity inversion software and you don't have a huge budget, so you can go out into the open source market and you can get this software called SIMPEG, which is effectively a least squares inversion tool. And with a little bit of tweaking, you'll find that it can do the job of producing high quality gravity inversions for you at a very low cost. You'll need a depth to basement model if you want to constrain your inversions. And what we've got here, you can go off on YouTube and watch a GeoHug presentation from Richard Scott about a topic called Mathimetry, which is our, our branding for our mathematically driven, data driven depth to basement model. Uh, we basically built that on the back of Uncover ML, which is a product that was released from the GSA. You need a 3D geological model of South Australia in order to define what your background geometry looks like. Thankfully, that was written, or sorry, that was produced in 2015, and that was published in, I think, 2020 on SARIG, so you can download that right now and pull that into any uh, 3D GIS that you want to work with. Then you need to know how dense each one of these units are, and that's a little bit more difficult. So what we did internally is we made this little video game called GeoBubble Sort, and we sent it around to all the geologists that we knew. And we just kept showing them all of the different lithologies in SA and said, which one of these two is heavier in your opinion? Until it started to consolidate into something that looked sensible. We also put some standards in there, uh, such as uh, heavy metal, uh, Metallica, for example. We started putting standards in there like the rock. Uh, interestingly, the rock came out to be the lens, least dense unit in Australia. It was really interesting. Uh, I would have figured he'd be the most dense. So, the last thing that you're going to need for that blue cap model is you're going to need spatial, uh, spatial data. So you just jump on SARIG and you can get all of the information that you could possibly need about existing infrastructure. So take all of that and pull it all together and stuff it into SIMPEG and then take your, your SIMPEG and produce about 90,000 overlapping inversions of the state. That's, that's not easy, but it's doable. And so we do this in AWS using parallel computing. We, we turn on about a thousand tiny little computers and say, go and invert that. And they repeat that overnight. And in the morning, it costs us a few thousand dollars and we get a complete coverage of South Australia with inverted block models. We incorporate the depth of basement. We incorporate the 3D state geo geology and the host density so that what we're estimating in our block models is, is more like true density than it is contrast of density because we know what the background is. Uh, we don't have to work on contrast. And we know that's likely wrong. That's almost certainly wrong. But these are problems that we can deal with at the other end. What we're trying to do right now is figure out where we're going to focus our activity to figure out if our assumptions correct. Uh, and we can update these anytime we like. Like I said, it's only a few hours overnight, a couple of thousand dollars. So let's say Dem decides to release a new open file data set, pump that in, update our, our parameters, run it all again. So after all of this is done, we apply a geometric algorithm and what we're looking for is cohesive bodies with density and geometry consistent with an IOCG. We characterize those and we feed it into blue cap. Coming out of Blue Cap, now we have locations and a theoretical NPV for every single IOCG lookalike in the state. So now we have every single economically viable IOCG lookalike in the state ranked by potential value. And we can prioritize that however we like NPV, open ground, preferred rock, new belt, whatever suits. But furthermore, you dig into it and you can query each one of these block models individually. So you check your anomalies, pick whatever is the most valuable as per your criteria, and go and have a closer look at it. Figure out which of the hypotheses have gone into the model that you have the most and the least confidence in, and there you can actually start to quantify the risk of pegging that ground and working it up. And once you bid on the ground, you know exactly what you need to do in order to validate your hypotheses. Do I need better gravity data? Do I need to validate my depth to source, et cetera? So you can design a program to validate your assumptions and where they hold true. You know for sure that you're drilling 
a target that if you do hit mineralization, it's economically viable. And all of that can be done in pre-competitive data here in SA, and that's a pre-competitive advantage. The last thing that you're gonna do is you go back to your board with that, and they say, well, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm kind of interested over here now. So, <laughs> sure, no problem. So they now want prospectivity analysis covering all of South Australia. Uh, and they want to be able to rapidly evaluate project opportunities coming in or they want to recognize opportunity in underexplored regions. And this is getting a little bit difficult. But what we can do is we, again, we want to build a data-driven methodology to robustly characterize many different deposit styles and as many different data layers as possible. This is a job for a convolutional neural network. So we're going to build one of those and we're going to train it with as much geoscientific data as we can. And we're going to map out potential of occurrences of mineral occurrences, mines, deposits. Uh, once we do that, we can start to combine things. So maybe we have a nickel map and a copper map. We combine those two together. We have maybe a nickel, copper, magnetic sulfide map. Uh, so this, again, no problem. We call this the explorer corn. So to train an explorer corn, what you need to do is go out and you need to extract features from data layers that are geoscientifically relevant. You go out and get as much as you possibly can. You want geology, geophysics, depth abasement, and while you're at it, you might as well throw in things like radiometric seismicity structure, whatever you can get. SARIG has quite a lot of this to play with. Just get all of it. So once you've got all of that, you wrangle it and stick it into a format that you can train and model with. Then you're gonna need something to define these are the targets. This is what I'm looking for. In order to do that, your targets are going to be things like mineral occurrences, showings, deposits, that sort of thing. So what we want to do is be able to tell the robot there's copper there, and then it learns over time. That's what copper looks like topologically across all these different types of data. And we do that several hundred times until it knows the pattern, and it can start telling us, hey, there's copper over there that you don't know about. What do we need to do that? Well, we need a spatial database of all of South Australia's known endowment. Uh, you might notice the theme, that's available on SARIG. You can just download that as well. So, go off, grab your favorite geology savvy data scientist, and you provision them with several hundred thousand milligrams of caffeine until they produce a convolutional neural network that's geologically aware. Your outputs become the probability of mineralization at any given location, and it's based on machine learned non-linear measurements of geology, structure, geophysics, and the lot. And because you've trained this on SARIG's database, you can also predict for things like lead and silver, uranium, zinc, whatever you want. And it's not just South Australia that has this available. You can get this in any state that you want in Australia, and including the GSA, they've got a huge data set to work with as well. So you grab your data scientist and you provision them with a bunch of craft beer tasting flights until a national scale one of these becomes available to you. And you can change your training targets to things like deposit style. Uh, if you want to try and find, there's a new VMS belt that hasn't been recognized. So all of this, all of this that I've talked about today, this is all doable with pre-competitive data which is incredible. There's a huge pre-competitive advantage here. So if you want to take this into more competitive, we've gone out and bought a database of 65,000 mineralized locations around the world, classified by size and grade and mineral system and that sort of thing. And so we've scaled this up. We have global models now that can do any commodity, any mineral system anywhere, and it'll give you the probability. In this case, this is an early run of global probability of IOCG, but we can do copper and diamonds and thorium and cobalt, and it all just comes through the fact that you build the model once and just repeat the framework. This is for sale. If, if you would like to come and have some project consulting, or if you're interested in a joint venture, or you're looking for a new project somewhere in Australia or, or maybe even the world, we can help you find some ground and peg it, and we're interested in any type of joint venture uh, um, arrangement or, or that sort of thing, or not. But it's available, and, and I'd love to talk to you about whatever you're interested in and see if we can work together and make something interesting happen. So look, what I'm showing here is a pre-competitive advantage is definitely doable. It's, it's possible here in South Australia. And what I've shown is some elements of our multidisciplinary approach to doing this in SA, and this is how you can secure a competitive advantage. And I'm, I'm sorry, Tom, you weren't going to be the only person with a Venn diagram. I had to jump in there. <laughs> so the big, big thanks to the South Australian Geologic Survey, the Department of Energy and Mines, South Australian government for making this sort of work possible through all of the great work that you do and all the data that you make available. Everyone else on stage today are the real heroes in this. We couldn't do this without your work. 
Uh, and similarly, hats off to my team. The innovation and data team at Oz are absolutely incredible, and all of our collaborators as well. I don't do any of the hard stuff. I just stand up here and talk about it. They do all the really fantastic hard work, and it's a, a real pleasure working with you. Uh, and thank you. Thanks for Oz Minerals for supporting this work. Any questions, my email's on the screen there. And uh, if you do have an unconventional drill target, we've got a website called Drillanthropy where you can submit your unconventional targets for funding. <laughs>